we have a special episode of the Craig Wolfley Podcast. Pittsburgh native and legend Ralph Sindrich is in studio today to talk about his new book, NFL Brawler, and his life in Pittsburgh, his playing days, his young days, and his current days. Here's your host, Craig Wolfley. How about that? We get we get we got a runner crowd, and then we got a, a run announcer. FM comes in, does a great job. What a great job! Oh, that was yeah, a good that, job. That, that, that was great. That, that was, was very good. That was bravo, baby. We like that. Ralph, I gotta say, I'm honored. I feel privileged. You come in, you sit down here. We get a chance. You got new book out, but you know, I I've always enjoyed, you know, kind of from afar <laughs> watching some of the things that you did, and uh, of course, you know, everybody knows, but you from your days at Pitt to being an NFL agent, an NFL player, and there's so many facets to your life. It's like, how do you put everything down into one book? Well, uh, you know, I, I don't know. When you look back on it, it doesn't seem all that intricate. You know, it's just you go and you play football and you wrestle and you go from there, from, from Little League to high school to college, so on to pros if you have that opportunity. And, and uh, you know, you end up getting married, having kids, and now, look at me, you become, <laughs> you know, become 65 years old, ready for retirement. How did we get this old, <laughs> Ralph? I don't understand. It, it went somewhere, they all say that. Everyone says that all the time. Right. But finally, it does, you know, you sit there and say, boy, that did go fast. It's amazing. You know, I mean, you are literally a, a, a Pittsburgh legend, okay? I, I, I'm, I'm telling you, brother. And one of the things, first thing I think about it, I'm reading the book, I says, oh, Gene Collier comes up at it. And I'm looking and going, let's see. He's talking about the Chief. Gene wrote the Chief. And you go, we got Rocky, Rocky, you know, Gene helped Rocky write, or wrote, did the Rocky Blyer the play. So when are we going to have the agent, huh? the one-man play? Ralph Sindrich starring in the agent or the, the brawler? Okay. That, that would be even better. I'm all for that, uh, and I had Gene actually help me at the beginning of it, which is why I, 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 I put him in there, and uh, subsequently I uh, talked with him and said, you know, we ought to do that. Uh, we have to uh, do something play-wise or incorporate this into something that uh, is more global than just related to the NFL and football, because you have some more stories in there. You know, you have Mario Gabarelli and Bill Frederick Sr. and Bruno San Martino and uh, the Nazis and all that, and Korean War, and so you can make a little bit more than just football. Let's start off with a novella. I mean, <laughs> you're a novella, and it's, uh, you know, I love the stories. You keep coming back to a novella in the foundation, but here's the thing that what's important to me is, is first of all, I think your dad and I were related. <laughs> oh. I, know, I know how backhands go. Oh. You know, I caught a few of them myself, oh. more than a few. But the, the fact is, there, there was a foundation that really kind of permeated your life as you you know, went on through the years. Without question, I, I, I've been blessed with the amount of help and the people around me from the time uh, I really started. And, uh, you know, I had uh, three angels that I talk about, and, and they, one of them is my wife, and still is, uh, but the, my mother and my, my Zia Rosa, but I also have my coaches in there who were central figures in my life. And my dad was a tough son of a gun and uh, you know he, he worked hard and late and long and and but my little league coaches Mario Gabrielli uh, uh, who was a war veteran and lost his leg in World War II in Normandy uh, but he set the values and the tempo for the players in my hometown uh, along with Abby Rush who was just uh, we call him a hoopy uh, and he's deceased now but he wasn't uh, actually presented me Pennsylvania Hall of Fame uh, so those guys were really close and when you have that you know, uh, I had someone ask me what what percentages uh, do you think uh, are out there with people that that uh, who helped you or making it or whatever, and I just had a tremendous amount of assistance all the way through. You know, I, I look at that the story of you is you, you're being I love love the bow and arrow. <laughs> now I had a similar situation, only it was just a suction cup bow, right? And I'm like eight nine years old. And I remember I got it at a Sunday school picnic. I get this bow and arrow. I got. I, get, I couldn't wait to get home. My dad's like, oh, "Now you never point this at anybody." Like a, you know, a, 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 yeah, it's, a suction cup is going to hurt anybody. <laughs> he goes and closes the garage door, and I, I let fly. I mean, I couldn't contain myself. It missed him by like an inch, you know. And it's, but it's, I never saw that bow and arrow again. <laughs> <laughs> I, I came over, backhand, got the bow and arrow gone. Yeah, you know, what was it with backhands back then? I mean, I mean, it was all part, you tell that to people now, they don't believe you. Oh, yeah, you know, it's yeah. a different era. And I think I think you stand a pretty good chance to get arrested. <laughs> Isn't that the truth yes, now? Indeed. Absolutely. Now, you go through, and, and you, you know, you talk about uh, your life, and, and it was fascinating to me about Jopa. 
You know, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I'm sitting there going, you know, are you the root of the whole Pitt Penn State problem? <laughs> I mean, do we put that at your feet? <laughs> It, it, it could have had a little bit to do with it, I think. Uh, yeah, well, old Joe and I go way back on that one, and it was never forgiven. I mean, we held we held that grudge until until the end, uh, uh, and I still hold it. He's gone. I still hold it. <laughs> okay, there's a time for forgiveness. Yeah, I guess. Maybe, maybe I'm gonna look this over. You're gonna work this out. I'm gonna get yeah. on my knees tonight. There you go. There you go. Well, I, I look at it. You decided to go to Pitt. What was it about Pitt that that swayed you? You know, uh, it wasn't anything that, that was the least bit illegal uh, or improper because, you know, my family and, and whatever were local and they knew that that would have turned uh, off uh, everyone. It was more the idea of saying, well, if you're going to do well, if you're going to have any success, why not do it at home to where people know you and you'll probably end up living and having children and you'll have it set, sort of, instead of coming into a new environment. So I think that was probably the primary reason and Pitt offered so much to me and quite frankly it came through on all of that. You know it's funny because when you're talking about achy knees and everything else, I go, oh my, I can only imagine. You know, and the wrestling stories and everything that, that's in there. You go into the NFL and uh, I, I hear these these names I grew up on because you were about eight years ahead of me. Yeah. I, I believe it was. So uh, you know Chuck Fairbanks. You sure it was that far? I, don't think. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I know. It looks like it was closer between yeah, you and me. I think the gap was a lot narrower than than it. But then, let's, I look at Chuck Fairbanks and some of the other names that you bring up, the the, the Bum Phillips and everything else, and and I get a kick out of it because the, you're you're coloring in gaps of my NFL experience that. You know, I didn't really know. Sure, and you know, they all have a history and they have a reputation, and and you know, there are a few of them I didn't like all that much. Uh, in fact, most of them I didn't like all that much. <laughs> Loved the heck out of Bum Phillips, though. I just thought Bum was was the the guy, and and really enjoyed him and my other coaches, Larry Peccatello and Richie Pettibone, and those guys. And uh, but I had the opportunity to play under a few Hall of Fame coaches, Sid Gilman, uh, who who taught us a little lesson, and. And also uh, Norm Van Brock, and I knew Norm had brain damage when he was coaching. You know, <laughs> he, he just couldn't say it. <laughs> no, coach, uh, that that wouldn't be what we'd do. But anyhow, yeah, yeah. oh my heavens! But yeah. you go through all this experience, and and uh, then you move on, becoming an agent. But let me ask you: when you when you look at this book, and you did you find anything out about yourself that surprised you? I mean, now as you look back at it, I mean, because looking in a rearview mirror, stories are great. A lot of times people say, oh, I love those stories. And you're like, well, yeah, they're funny now, but they weren't funny <laughs> 10 years ago, you know? you know? Well, you know, that's the thing, because you never really know. I mean, you're going on instinct and feeling and luck, and it's what you, you know, when you, when you played football and you wrestled, and, you know, you, you were weighing all those factors, and right. so it was the same thing. But, but you know, when, when you're going to bed with cold, sweaty hands and feet, you know, you want that stuff to end, but you know that if you're getting into the long holdouts to mid-season, that you better suck it up and get, you know, start to be able to handle that for that, for that period of time or just cave. What surprised you when you wrote this? Yeah. Something, what jumped out at you and said, you know, now that I look at this, I'm going, how did I live through that? Or, or what was it that, that made this a very special time? Wow. You know, I think, I think, the the silver medal goes to to you know my dad uh, and and uh, just how I made it through alive with him I don't know <laughs> I mean that's my mystery uh, I came very very close really truly and he was uh, you know there were other stories I mean he he tried to drown me up in the Poconos I'm telling you uh, you know came AJ out. was a rough oh, guy he was a rough one and so we have all those stories and there are more of them than, but uh, I I, th I think just the fact of, of looking back on it and and seeing that there was so much structure there with, with uh, leadership and with doing the right thing and, and that was from my father having a dad around all the time and also having uh, uh, the little league coaches all the way through and, and, and you know those guys were just like parents to me they were around uh, and uh, you know when I got beat in the state finals uh, 
uh, you know, Ab Rush, uh, my little league coach, I cried all the way back with him. You know, I mean, it was just one of those things that, you know, you never expect to lose and, and uh, not like that. And, and so those were the ones that I could open up to. You know, I could say where, you know, you can say where you're weak, where you have problems uh, and not uh, I feel that someone's going to take advantage of that. Tell me about the Thunderbolt. With Mary Rose, and the bold this bold. is this is beautiful because as I told you before, when I first read it, I thought he's talking about Kennywood and the roller coaster out there. It's not has nothing to do with that. The, the, the Thunderbolt is uh, from 905 Fifth Street Beaver, and that's that's my wife Mary Rose. And the first time I met her uh, was at a fraternity party, and you know there was a lot of a lot of smoke and other things that were going on there drinking. But I was in between Easterns, and I was beat up. I, I wrestled very poorly in, in the Easterns, and and one guy did you know, my in fact I got my eye fixed later on. But uh, I saw her for the first time at the party, and and I instantly fell in love like in the movie that you see The Godfather where you just feel something come down that takes you over and I have that feeling uh, at that time uh, and, if, and if I don't I'm sticking with that story <laughs> <laughs> that's my story and I'm sticking to it <laughs> now, now how did you convince this, this beautiful genteel lady that you, I mean, you, you, you're about as, you sound as cuddly as a porcupine, all right, early on, all right? Thank you. I'm sorry. Yeah. Hey, you wrote the book. I didn't, okay? So, yeah. but, but I mean, seriously, you grew up, you, you were a tough guy. I mean, you were an Avella tough guy. You, you had a lot of life experiences that kind of hardened you. So then you've got to, you know, kind of relate to a, 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 a fine lady on a different level. Yeah, and, and I think, you know, really all her, I mean, being able to uh, be uh, thrown into other environments, you know, to where, where you have to conduct yourself differently. And, and uh, of course, uh, she, she was a very good student too. Uh, she gradu graduated magna uh, cum laude, or number one in her class, and she was up there on, at Pitt until she met me. My grades went up, she went way down. <laughs> But uh, we, we have two children, and, and it it's really is a, a marriage that was, you know, would have never happened with me, uh, with somebody else. I mean, the whole... She make you a better man? Oh, jeez, yeah. No, no question. All the way around. There, there's no, no chance of, of being where I am right now, having done what I did outside of sports. Uh, uh, and of course, on the agent side, where you know it got down and dirty, you know she was always in the background. But, but those words that she used to hear <laughs> never seemed to bother her too much. She loved you. Yes. Yeah. I, yeah, she better it. <laughs> that's her story. Yeah, she's that, sticking she's to sticking it. She's sticking to it now, and she's in good shape now. Yes. <laughs> Tell me a little bit about well, first of all, the the jump into becoming an agent. Yeah. That's not the easiest. That's. No. But it was easier back then, and would have been for you too, because we played. Right. You know, so you okay. come in, and and I really had a tremendous advantage over. They didn't have the internet and all the other things. You couldn't learn about football. I knew football. Right. I had to learn more than the other guys to stay alive. So I had to learn all those extra things uh, on special teams, and and I'd memorize the guys on special teams too. If someone goes down, I'd let the coach know. I'd make sure the backup knew. I'd do those little extras to make sure that that I was on the team. Uh, so. But I knew going into the NFL that I was going to have somewhat of a limited career, uh, not to make excuses. You know, everybody you talked to could have could have done this or that before a knee injury or a shoulder or whatever. But but my goals changed after getting into uh, uh, through college and after blowing my knee. I knew I had to make a living in another way, and it was very good. I probably wouldn't have done it otherwise. You you, you had several people that. Uh uh, fascinating to me, of course. Uh, guys like Mark May, you know, grew up watching him. Sure. You know, uh, well, he came out the same time, you know, but I watched him as a contemporary, as a guy. Uh, Bill Freilich, uh, Dermani Dawson. Um, t tell me, who was your favorite? Ooh. I mean, can, now, look, okay. uh, here's uh, full disclosure. You talk about the fact that it's a family, yeah. okay? And you, so you're taking them within the boundaries of family rather than clients, right. so right. it's a different atmosphere. But you got to have a couple guys, maybe that are, that are well, special. You know, I think those who you start out with uh, are something special. You know, it's your first or whatever. And, and Mark May is like a little brother. I mean, he, he's a pain in the butt. Oh, he just drives me nuts at times, and and I him. But 
We always seem to have a basis of a relationship, like a marriage almost, where we'd be able to come back. Uh, so uh, when, when you look at some of those early guys that, uh, and you know, I made my niche, and this is it's why you, you kind of like me, it's because offensive linemen. I did it with all the offensive linemen. Absolutely. I, I love those guys. I mean, I really did. There just wasn't the ego. There wasn't the problems. It, yeah. You know, it was just, they were just normal guys, like, like the boots uh, in a vela. No question about it. I mean, that, I mean, Der, Dermani Dawson is is a beautiful human being. He is. He's. By the way, did you ever have any of his uh, gourmet chocolate chip cookies? Oh, he could make some. Yeah, he used to make gourmet chocolate chip cookies. He'd bring them in, man. He never got. Oh, I never. if I were you, I'd say, Dermani, you owe me some chocolate chip cookies. I talked to Wolfley. Wolfley says they were great. Oh, yeah, I would let him have it right between the eyes for that one. I'm gonna let him know that. Uh, <laughs> Uh, you know, a great guy, great guy to work with, and at the same time, Will Wolford comes to the Steelers too. You know, a little bit later, yes. and you know, you'd bring anybody. Uh, and I won't, I won't, won't get into names. But there was another guy I represented with the Steelers who made it to the Pro Bowl because he played guard and he played next to Demani and should have never left, uh, but left on a contract going to Arizona uh, for more money. It was just pure dollars, and you know, you're around this business, you don't do that. If a guy, you have that type of success, all of a sudden there. Are reasons for it, and Damani Dawson was a big, big part oh, yeah. of that reason. Yeah, you know, you look at some of these guys. Ken Hall, love that name. Oh. You know, uh, what a, what a fine human being he was. Yeah, you know, I uh, can't tell that story without crying. I believe it. Yeah. I believe it. I think everybody, uh, and you know, Kent Hall was just a, a leader uh, of the Buffalo Bills team. And when Scott Norwood uh, missed that uh, field goal, and it went to the right. Uh, there wasn't anybody for him in the locker room. He was by himself, and there was Kent Hall, my client, who was there. And uh, every guy on that team, if you look at the guys on on the team, and you know, all Hall of Fame guys, they all felt the same, said the same thing about Kent, that he was a leader and a tough guy. But Kent pulled him aside and said, hey, look, it's not all your fault. All of us, including me, if we had moved that ball up a little bit more, we could have done this or that. And so he walked out, and this was about told by the New York Times, he walked out of the dressing room with him and withstood That's all cool. that with him. Yeah, yeah he, I, he was I, I wasn't surprised when I read that story. I said, you know, that sounds exactly like Ken Hall. The other, another guy, Bill Fralick, what I love, you, you orchestrated this entire thing with the great <laughs> legendary Bruno San Martino. Now, i got to tell you something. I've always been a Bruno fan. So back a few years ago, I get this call from a guy. He wants me to do this thing. It's sports poetry, okay? And up at CMU or something like that, right? Oh, he you, says, you'd be per you're perfect for that. Oh, oh yeah. Now, now listen to <laughs> how this went out. He goes, we got, we got Lynn Swan, we got Andy Russell, we got it. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, he goes, And he goes, we got Bruno San Martino. Now, I turned this guy down twice before he tells me Bruno's in. I said, Bruno San Martino says it's cool. To, to do sports poetry, he goes, yeah, he's reading something. I go, I'm in. Yeah. You know, I, I like that. I just, if Bruno says it's cool, it's, it's cool. cool. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, big teddy bear guy who, uh, when I was at Pitt, he would always go over to the uh, school for the blind. No one ever knew that, saw that. You know, there were never right. lights or cameras, or but he'd always do that and other things too. And so I got to know him a little bit and used him in the leverage part of getting Bill Frey Jr. to to say, well, he's going to wrestle <laughs> if he doesn't sign a contract. Because Bill was a great wrestler in high school. He, you know what? And he, he, I had to go to camps and do a lot of different things. Bill never did any of that stuff. He was just a pure stud, a guy who was way mature before his years and went in. And, you know, uh, his matches that he lost, most of them were when he was very young, like a sophomore, and these guys were seniors and right. a lot more mature. So, yeah, I mean, he was just a, a super athlete. You know, we're going to take a break, but I want to pick it up right after because I want people got to hear how you orchestrated this little thing with Bruno in the office and then he walks out while you're negotiating a contract. Right here, more from the legendary Ralph Sinvich. Okay, so when we left off, we got Billy Freilich Jr. You're negotiating for with the Atlanta Falcons. Yes. You got Bruno San Martino. Now you got everything all coordinated out. I mean, you are you're setting up trying to negotiate more money for Bill, and 
you got Bruno in on this like it's, uh, it's he's going to turn pro wrestling, right? And Bruno was willing to do it. I mean, that was the big <laughs> thing. It, it was it was really uh, uh, Bill Frederick Sr. who who uh, uh, wanted to create some type of leverage or whatever and said Billy can wrestle and all. And, and uh, it, it was like in the second year of WWE or WF, whatever it was at the time. And Bruno was still a big star. Big, oh, yeah. Big teddy bear. Everybody loved him. Uh, and... Uh, uh, he came came down to the office, and I had him sitting in the overlooking uh, the Civic Arena. It was my brother Bob, who was a uh, became a federal judge and U.S. attorney for the Western District, uh, and so it, it was a power type of setting. And I had it set up to when you walk in, I was sitting on one side, Billy Freilich was uh, sitting on another side, Bruno San Martino, and then I had Tom Bratz walk in, and Tom being the general manager of the Atlanta Falcons, doing the negotiations. And I had done a little reconnaissance on Tom, and I I knew that he loved to. Uh, uh, fish and drink beer. <laughs> Who doesn't? You know, I mean, it's one of the. And so we we uh, had it set up, to, uh, or I did, to go fishing. But first, we'd do this little thing. And when Tom Bratz came in, uh, Bruno got up and left. And <laughs> now I love how you described the scene. He got up with a very knowing look and everything else, and I'm sure that Bruno was probably slightly buffed and pumped at the time. I don't, I don't think there's any, there's any doubt about that. And, and and Tom is that tough old German from uh, Wisconsin, and just a good guy. I mean, one of those guys you really like, but he wouldn't move. Nobody would move. And Freilich was the number two pick in the in the entire draft, and Bruce Smith had long ago signed. And and so uh, I figured, uh, well, Tom had asked me to go fishing, maybe five six times or go drinking and one thing you, you know you got to you had to be smart with the GMs who you went drinking with someone just drinking under the table you make any kind of deal deal but I coated my stomach with Pepto-Bismol uh, uh, bought a couple of cases of Iron City beer uh, went out to the country and we threw in our lines and and uh, all of a sudden we start getting close to this thing and I got the major Iron City buzz on and I'm thinking how do I get this down on paper uh, and uh, Somehow I do get it down there, and and uh, and it's uh, a rabbi trust. It was the rabbi. what? What? I, how does that come up? You know, uh, old man Frank Bill Senior says, uh, Ralph. Uh, you know, I uh, I love my son, but I know the son of a gun. Uh, he'll spend every dime he gets his hands on. So you got to get him a lot of money now and a lot of money later. <laughs> You know, great plan, Bill. Uh, let me work on that. So, <laughs> yeah, and, when you when you can, when you can you know pass it around, let everybody else know. Yeah. You? But Bill Frederick oh. Senior was a union boss. He was a right. tough guy. He was he he was he was always there for me and and uh, uh, and a marine too. Uh, I, Mistakenly had it have in the book the army and and I I've already heard about okay. that. it's the it's the Marines but Got it. uh, so uh, basically uh, there was a guy Mal Levy at a Pittsburgh law firm Buchanan Ingersoll who came up with this concept uh, and I was able to negotiate it somehow with the Falcons and it was really a lump sum deposit into a trust to where it couldn't be touched by by anyone and it was created by by a, uh, a synagogue for the rabbi and uh, there was enough money put in there so that Bill Frederick would receive uh, 15 years from deposit or 20 years from deposit uh, I'm pretty sure 15 or 20 uh, 150 thousand dollars a year for the rest of his life Good grief no matter what and if he died before the uh, uh, six million uh, was used up he would get uh, his estate would receive six million and by so his total contract was seven point six million and by way of comparison Bruce Smith was something like two point six. Wow. at the time. So it was a monster contract. It fell into place. I don't know if it could ever happen again. It was the first time ever, and it's never been done again. It's, in fact, it's off the books. You can't do it anymore. I was going to say, it seems like you were uh, groundbreaking uh, several new contracts with the NFL. Yeah, you know, I, I was. In, they let me know that, too, when they... When they <laughs> When they sued me for five hundred thousand dollars, two counts of two hundred fifty thousand dollars each, yeah, they were after me, and and you know I, uh, I don't know. I, to me, it was just a a game, I guess, uh, where I was representing my guys, and I was supposed to do everything I could, uh, but the NFL was looking for me. You know, Ralph, one of the constant uh, things that seems to underlie uh, your life is is fighting for your clients. I mean, it seems like you took this real personal. You know, what I mean, you know. I mean, when, when somebody entrusted their future to you, you really took that uh, to heart. I did, and thank you. I mean, that's probably the uh, the best, highest compliment uh, that I could ever be paid. And and, and I did look at it that way. And, and I, I use one rule always. 
what would I do if this were my son? Mm. And it's 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 a nail it's a never fail uh, test to put on yourself in my position. Uh, I know where my duty always lied, but you, sometimes it gets fuzzy up there. You know, you have good relationships with the clubs. You don't want to overstep your bounds. You got all these other factors coming in. But if you if you come down to that test and you say this is my son. Uh, would I advise him to go out and play? Mm. Would I advise him to go this direction or whatever? And, you know, it changes things. You, you don't always go for the highest and best dollars. Uh, you know from playing, it's, it's, it's a balance in the NFL. If you find a team, a spot, a situation, uh, you don't mess around with that too much. You know, that, that's, pre that's pretty good. Uh, and, and so with a lot of guys, you've you got to act, I think, maybe a little bit more of a counselor, um, maybe even a little uh, little bit of a parent uh, in saying, okay, you know, what, what would I want my son to do? And it's a good test. You know, we talked earlier about who the guys that you, you, you really loved, who broke your heart? You know, I mean, not, oh, yeah. saying, I mean the, the, you, you don't get through a business like this oh. without getting some potholes. Oh. I mean, you, you, you extend yourself, you know, and you, you can get run over, too. There's no doubt, and, and that happens in this business when you're dropped. In in uh, it's like old Bum Phillips used to say, uh, "There's two two types of coaches: <laughs> them that's fired, and them that's going to be fired." And that's, that's Bum was always the best with us. <laughs> oh, I loved him. I loved him. Uh, and Wade too. Wade was my coach. Uh, but and going back and looking, I I think maybe right at the very beginning. Uh, there were a couple guys where I learned I had done the same thing for them that I had for Mark May and did all. Uh, and why do you write a book uh, as you look back on it all? You know, there very very few could be as loyal as Mark May could 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 have been as good of a friend all the way through. We always hung up on each other and did all that stuff, but there was a, there was a love there. Early on, I had that happen by a couple of guys who just didn't want to pay their bill. Mm -hmm. But it, but all of a sudden, you know, you, you have that, uh, if you've been beat in wrestling or, in, or even on a football field, you, you know, you start questioning yourself. Am I good enough? Did I do the right things and all? And, and so uh, it would go back really right at the inception. After that, uh, it was always the worst call, the worst feeling to be discharged. And it's going to happen in, in the agent business a lot of times. When you when you look back at it now, how has the NFL evolved? I mean, you know, you look at when you broke into this business, there was there was no um, requirements to be an agent. No, the NFLPA wasn't uh, you know brokering, licensing, certifying anything. Um, it was kind of like the Wild West a little bit, um, but it's changed. How has it changed both from an, an agent perspective and you as a former player? Well, first, as a player perspective, you know, you could you could walk into a, a bar and someone would give you a little shot or whatever else, and and you could give them a pop and nobody would know. You know, you see a guy, you know, uh, or or if a guy want to take a whiz on the back street. I mean, I don't want to be, you know, but you can't do those things anymore. There's too much social media. There's too too much of all of that uh, that is going on. So in that sense, the bar is much higher for the conduct of players. Uh, and you know, back in the old days, you know, uh, we used to like to have guys like Bobby Lane and, and whatever else who, who, who would carouse and fight and do all the rest. You can't do that anymore. Uh, so uh, I, I think from that, uh, that part of it, and you know, on the agent part, the, the Gene Upshaw changed, uh, you know, he, he wasn't at all for the players who made the game, the older players. He only took care of the newer guys under his watch. And there's something shallow about that, something uh, that, that, that is missing. And, and to me, that had a change uh, on the game and in the reflection with the players and all the, the guys that I work with. Uh, uh, nowadays, they're much better taken care of by the Players Association. Still not the same, but, but much better benefits, and there's more coming than with the old guys like yourself. We are old guys. It's okay, brother. It's okay. Yeah. But that if, if you could leave one message, one thing, all right, that, that you look at your life and you say, this is what I want everybody to know about me, what would be that one thing? Always honest and always did my best. You know, if I'm not honest, I catch myself. You know, if I'm, and it's like anybody else, you, 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 you start to say, oh, wait a minute, you know. Uh, so I think those two things, uh, uh, I'd, I'd like to think uh, I could be remembered for. Now, before we go, we got to make sure, how do you get the book? 
and what? how would we get hold of you on Twitter? The social media, the things that, we, you know, you and I didn't grow up with, but now you all of a sudden it's got to have a, a Twitter handle and this and all that. So. Well, you got to be on Twitter. I mean, I've, I've already been threatened to be killed on uh, Twitter. I mean, I think that happens a little bit. <laughs> no. no. Uh, my handle, on, it's uh, Ralph, uh, R-A-L-P-H, uh, Sindrich, that's Sind as in Cindy, Rich as in money, and, and I don't have any. Uh, Ralph <laughs> at Sindrich, you know. Uh, You've been practicing yes, this. That's, that's, no, it's, it's, you always have to explain your name. And uh, Amazon, and it's on the, uh, uh, Tantor has the audio, and it's really, and should be in all the stores and uh, everything else at this time. And, and uh, I, think it, uh, I think it'd make a good Christmas present. You know, I want to thank you. It's been a privilege. I've long admired you. The book is NFL Brawler. He is Ralph Sindrich, and he is a Pittsburgh legend. Thank you for your time. Thank Ralph. you. I appreciate it. 